Okay, if I can uh, call the meeting to order, and can I welcome everyone to this, the 11th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2019. We have apologies from David Torrens, and I welcome Rona Mackay, who is attending as committee substitute. We have three items in the agenda this morning. Agenda item one is the consideration of whether to take agenda item three in private. Our members agree to take item three, petition 1319, on improving youth football in Scotland in private. Thank you. Um, agenda item two is the consideration of continued petitions. The first petition for consideration today is petition 1693 on establishing an independent water ombudsman lodged by Graham Harvey on behalf of the Lowlands Canals Association. Members may wish to note that since the petition was lodged, the lead petitioner, Graham Harvey, has stepped down from his role as chair of the Lowlands Canal Association. We recently received a written submission from Graham Harvey, which the clerks have provided us with for our consideration of the petition today. At our last consideration of this petition on 20th December 2018, we discussed the role of the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman, the implications of creating a new Ombudsman and the current repair backlog as stated by Scottish Canals. In order to explore these and other issues further, members agreed to invite Scottish Canals to give evidence. And I'd like to welcome today's, to today's meeting representatives from Scottish Canals. We welcome Catherine Topley, the Chief Executive, Richard Miller, Director of Infrastructure, Claire Lithgow, Director of Finance, and Josie Saunders, Head of Corporate Affairs. And can I invite you to provide a brief opening statement of up to no more than five minutes in total, after which we'll move to questions from the committee. Welcome. Thank you. Since taking on the role at Scotch Canals last year, it was uh, an aspiration for Scottish Government and one of the tasks that they provided me was to work closely with uh, the boating community as well as many of the other communities that we serve. We're here today to talk about the boating community, so I'll keep my evidence within that, that sphere. It's clear that the boating community have felt that they've not had the close and good working relationship with Scottish Canals for some time. As a consequence, we have worked very hard over the last year to build on that not only within looking at how we look and use the canals, but also how we live and utilise them. The canals have a £70 million backlog, as we have stated previously. Now, that is a figure that, had we implemented and had the finances to do so, would bring the canals up to the state of repair in terms of new. So, from the perspective, we have to be realistic that actually, from that £70 million, there is a proportion of that there is around immediate and ready repairs. Richard has always had an ongoing and good working relationship, as has Josie, Katie and Claire, although these can deviate and at times depending on what is happening within the business. And I think it's fair to recognise the willingness from the management team to continue that working relationship in the past and in the future. In terms of the asset as a, a working heritage asset, we have to recognise that with the age of the asset, there will be ongoing uh, repairs and maintenance that's required of the asset. And I think working with the boaters and explaining the asset management strategy, incorporating their views and the issues associated with the canal, I think that transparency around the state of the canal has certainly helped that relationship. I cannot, as I sit here today, guarantee that the canals will always be open and that we will always be able to fix them and maintain them. What I can say is that we work readily to ensure that they are safe and that they are compliant in terms of what is required of them. And by speaking and working with the boaters, we can make sure that that extends throughout Scotland. Today we are looking specifically from LCA around a waters ombudsman, which focuses particularly around the central belt of Scotland. But of course, Scotland's canals is 240 miles of canals across Scotland. With that in mind, we also have to keep in mind the Crinan and Caledonian Canal, which also bring to Scotland a significant amount of tourism, transit and activity along the Scottish breadth of uh, the geography. We're happy to answer any questions the committee may have for us today. From our perspective, we're happy to be objective about the issues that are, are presented to us and honest about the, the journey that has led us to this position. Okay, thank you. I suppose you'll be aware that really the focus of the petition is on what can be done if people are not satisfied mm -hmm. with what you're doing. You've outlined a problem and a challenge, but the question is if people are not satisfied with what you're doing, um, what recourse have they got? So, 
I wanted to ask really about, as the committee understands the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman has no powers to assess the overall quality of the service being provided by Scottish canals. They are also unable to investigate matters relating to rent and service charges as they are an excluded category. So who deals with these issues, including any disputes with Scottish canals, if not the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman? As I've submitted in the previous submission, there is um, we follow a complaints process internally, and uh, these complaint processes are are processed and managed uh, through that. I think the particular issue around the the pricing is clearly a motive one, and I completely understand that. Um, the context of this, of course, is that in, at the time those discussions were underway, we had such varying degree of inconsistency in the pricing along the canals that we actually had two berths sitting right next to each other that were entirely different pricing structures. So from that perspective, it was appropriate and fair and transparent that we, we implemented something um, for uh, the wider kind of usage of that across Scotland. And we did that in an open and transparent way, as you know, so coming back to your main question around what is the process, well, we would use the internal process that we've already used, which allows individuals to raise the complaint to be formally investigated, and then following that, this two-stage uh, process, and then escalating to the SPSO. I understand that there isn't specifically a space um, that individuals could complain around the pricing, as the SPSO um, underlines. However, there is an open... An, fair dialogue around how we've got to that and bearing in mind the voters in the community have been part of that consultation. Mm. So with that in mind, I would I would question whether or not the the numbers associated with that complaint are reflective of the overall process and individuals involved in that. But there, there is there are no recourse. If you decide that's the cost, that's the cost, it's a monopoly. There is no one you can go. You may say it's transparent and reasonable and necessary, but there, there is nowhere else for the complainant to go. As, as it currently stands, there is there is nothing that would stop the Scottish Canals um, putting on um, a significant hike on, on the pricing, other than the fact that we've already agreed a pricing strategy with the boaters, and therefore that will not change in the forthcoming period. Um, I think the other thing that would obviously mitigate us doing that is that we are a, an NDPB and from that perspective we would not look to act in such a commercial way that would put individuals in, hard, in, in hardship. From our perspective we want the boaters on the, on the water so we wouldn't want the prices to be such that it would exclude individuals doing so. But there is there, uh, at the heart of this so there may be good intention but there's nothing that compels Scotch Canals to to. They, they could, if they wished, hike prices further. At the end of the day, the part of the, the Scottish Canal's um, remit is to act as a commercial operation in, in this, this aspect. And, of course, what we'd want to do is, is to make sure that the commercial uh, aspect of boating and the, and the pricing associated with that is relevant. So, yes, there is the opportunity for the, the canals to increase prices in line with market in the future, but that's all it would ever be. So, so the commercial operation, which is necessary because there's a shortfall in monies to sustain the canals, um, may mean that you're making decisions that uh, people using canals would be unhappy with? That may be the case, yes. Mm. Okay, thank you. Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, um, convener. Uh, good morning to the, the panel. From some of the submissions we've received, um, there are significant concerns uh, being raised that uh, ongoing canal maintenance is suffering as a result of Scottish Canal's focus on asset investments. So would you say the right balance has, has been struck between asset investment and canal maintenance? And how would you respond to concerns that Scottish Canal's is diverging from its statutory obligation to maintain the canals? I would respond first to your second point to advise that certainly within the framework agreement, uh, Scotch Canals um, are asked, as you know from the submissions that we've presented, to act in a, in a manner that would allow us to be able to regenerate the canal but also make the best use of the canal, which includes commercial operations. The, can the canal cannot, in isolation, stand alone with just boats on it. And I think the boaters would absolutely agree to that. 
Um, the reality is the canal, the canal is so vibrant because of the other activity that runs alongside it and therefore making it a much more pleasurable and enjoyable experience, not just for the boaters, but for the walkers, the cyclists, the dog walkers, etc. So from that perspective, the, the expanse of what we need to look at in the canal cannot solely just be focused on one area. And of course, the canals, as you know, um, going back 15, 20 years, were a place where we kept our shopping trolleys and couches, and it was just a really, really poor, dire state and, and quite an embarrassment, actually. Um, to Scotland in terms of where they got to. Um, so to be able to maintain that, to have a very positive, flourishing environment, we have to have activities along the canal. And those activities have to be things that draw the community in and that the community want to be part of. So from that perspective, that is why the commercial and the regeneration arm is really hand in hand for us, because we want to make sure that, that we don't lose that vibrancy. Um, the first part regarding the balance of commercial um, and asset. I will, I will also ask Richard to comment on this in a moment, um, but actually the commercial and that asset go hand in hand in as much as we can never be fully, financial, fully financially sustainable with £10 million, which I absolutely agree is a lot of money for anybody. However, in investment terms, that £10 million can only be recycled through so many activities at any given time. Consequently, we have to ensure that we have a balance between the commercial activity, rev revenue generating activity and sustaining and de delivering on our, our core business. And I'd also like to highlight and underline that the grant and aid cannot be used for these activities. So the government grant and aid that is given for our statutory responsibility of looking after the canal of 8.5 million this year cannot be used for anything other than the canal. Now, to give you some context, um, in the accounts that will be published very soon, um, the staffing costs alone for Scotch Canals is 9.5 million. So that any of the monies that we are generating have to kind of maintain not only the canal, but obviously the running of the canal. And where that money goes is to ensure that that wider piece is done. So we are already contributing to the running of the canals through our commercial model. What I'd like to do is pass to Richard, just to come up, comment a little bit more on that, <coughs> and then I'd happy to take further questions. I mean, I think in regard to the asset management strategy, I mean, this is something that we've been working on for some time, and, and I think as a, a very appropriate for a public organisation like ourselves that look after 140 miles of historic waterways that are between 200 and 250 years old that do have inherent risk because they are engineered channels that hold back water. And therefore, it, there is always a requirement for us to find a balance between how we are investing in the core infrastructure of those, the locks, the lock gates, the, the reservoirs and, and the aqueducts, and the maintenance and the operation that we deliver on, on the canal. And, and I think what that asset management strategy, which has been totally aligned with, with international best, best practice and has actually been, uh, I think, is, is, is very much a forward-looking plan that people have seen as best practice around about how we've done this. And we've looked at these questions and it has, what it has brought forward is, is some really challenging questions for Scottish Canals around about how the amount of money that we have and how we spend that and how we prioritise that if we don't see uh, the increase in, in funding that is required, how will we make decisions that are sensible, rational and, and make sure that we keep the, the best of the canals operational? We are absolutely determined to keep all of these canals operational and, and, and in navigation because we know the value that the towpath and the water space brings to Scotland is massive. And there's no doubt that's our, you know, that's the very core of what we're doing here. But I think the asset management strategy, which I know has been contentious with, with some of the boaters, but it does, it has helped us to, to understand what our liabilities are, the level of investment that we require, and, and how we should invest. And we've been very lucky, we've worked very closely with Scottish Government, and we've seen uh, uh, an increase, uh, and, a, and a, a substantial increase in our capital investment. But there is still a requirement for revenue. Revenue is very important to when you're running 250-year-old structures because there's a lot of patching and repairs that you need to do, and that can only be funded out of revenue. And therefore, we've had to create and look at the business to make sure that we've got a balance between commercial side of the business developing new revenue streams so that we can develop and, and do those patch repairs. Because our 
revenue funding has remained static right through the recession. In the past, uh, in about 2009, it was up at 11 and a half, moving to 12 and a half million. But since, uh, since certainly 2011, it's been static at about eight million pound, a slight upcrease, uplift this year. So revenue is really important to us in the task that we need to do. And having that balance within the business is something that we're striving to deliver. Okay, thank you. Okay. Convener, good morning. Um, you have £9.5 million pounds staffing costs. Um, I'm just wondering, given the challenges that you're outlining and that you, you face, um, have you ever looked at um, making efficiency savings within your own administration? I'm thinking particularly of director salaries or, you know, the higher paid salaries. Um, I mean, £9.5 million staffing costs is quite high. Um, I'll, I'll start uh, to take that forward and then I'll pass to Claire, the Finance Director, to, to comment further. Um, so, yes, in short, so we continually look at the efficiencies. When you look at the staffing numbers of the organisation, they've not significantly varied over the last eight years. And therefore, I'm confident that the organisation hasn't lost control of its um, staffing costs in terms of the numbers. I think what we've seen is a combination of increases around things like the Scottish Living Wage, um, the uplift in terms of pension costs and corporate costs. And of course, with a very static GIA 8 million, we've, we've incurred those costs internally, which clearly eats away at any of the money that we're producing in terms of profit. In terms of the director salaries, um, the previous chief executive was on a, a different salary and through the movement of, of his role, there was an opportunity to review that. And in line with Scottish Government policy, there was an aspiration to reduce that by 10%, which has currently um, been achieved. Um, Claire, I'll ask you to comment yeah. further. Good morning. Mm -hmm. um, I think also we should be bearing in mind the cost of public sector pensions. Scottish Canals has moved from its DB pension scheme to a DC pension scheme. As we've done that, that will have an impact as those members in our old closed DB scheme move on from the organisation in one way or another. Uh, so we've moved to a DC pension scheme where we've got more certainty over our future pension costs and liabilities. But we are part of the Scottish Government's public sector pay policy. So we've taken year-on-year -year increases in line with pay policy. We have no incremental pay increases, so we've capped any movement in the uh, overall wage bill from annual, an annual increase perspective in line with Scottish Government pay policy. And we've made that move from a DB to a DC pension scheme as well in an effort to reduce that overall wage bill. We've also done quite a lot of work over the last 18 months or so around productivity to ensure that we're getting the biggest um, value from our workforce, that we're maximising that productivity. And as Catherine said, we haven't increased our overall headcount. Just to clarify, did you say that the director's salary had been cut by 10%? The, the chief, exec chief, executive. chief executive has yeah. been cut by, yeah. by 10%. But under the tier under, the chief executive has remained... There's started. been no change in, in the people in post. Okay. But the number of directors has reduced recently by one. So yeah. the, the Does pool that indicate that perhaps previously it was top-heavy and it was too high? I think in terms of the structure of the organisation, how we've aligned our operations to try and build in um, greater productivity and efficiency, we've streamlined what we do, and therefore we felt that as an organisation that the structure and the directorship structure was more appropriate with one less person. Okay. Thank you. Richard Hamilton. Thank you. Um, Richard, the, the work that you're doing with the asset management strategy, um, how do you, uh, can you illustrate how your return on investment is contributing to the operations and maintenance of the core canals? So, I mean, I think what we can prove is, is that um, we are uh, tirelessly developing, um, and we had, and I think as you saw in the papers, there was a £10 million, what we call the dowry, from when we split from British waterways to becoming Scottish canals, um, as a result of monies that had flowed south of the border when we were one UK organisation, we were able to prove the case that there was uh, that monies had flowed in that direction and that uh, when we split away to become Scottish Canals that we required those and we needed those back and, and we were successful in achieving £10 million of investment and we've been using that as a commercial uh, investment um, pot which has been invested some in capital growth and developing and, and they, those sites have always been around about the canal, close to the canal, opportunities that will add value to the communities. And you've got to remember the canals of Scotland, there's a million people live within three kilometres of the canal and 20% of Scotland's most challenged communities are on the banks. And we very much worked with the board to focus 
that investment to bring a double whammy in, in regard to delivering beside the canal, but also delivering in some of those challenged communities. And therefore, we've been making and seeing capital returns that will be reinvested to help to grow. But we've also put half of that money into developing revenue opportunities that have increased our uh, income. And when you look at the stat accounts, you can see that the income coming into Scottish canals has increased tremendously over the last few years. And as Claire says, there's challenges within the business as to the corporate overheads and, and the, the growth in, in pensions, but also the living wage and following government um, policy, those have had implications. So it is, it's about time. Five million pound isn't a lot of money in regard to developing income streams. These things take time, but there's no doubt that they are moving in, in, in the right direction and we are beginning to see those returns back to the business. What we need to do over time is, is work and develop those and therefore they will tip into bringing value to the canals in the future too. So uh, would you agree then that the, um, the resource that you're, you're talking about um, is sufficient that's been directed to the canal maintenance rather than the asset development? I, I think canal maintenance and asset development is, is, is the same for me in, in regard to what I would see it as, as the asset management plan looks at the foundation structures. The structures, we've got 4,100 major structures and then 140 miles of canal banks and embankments and towpaths. And what we do through the asset management strategy is look at what is required to keep and maintain those, uh, those in good condition. You can see from works that we've done recently, we've done a lot of work around Linlithgow and improving the embankments there because the canal holds back 31 and a half miles of water. We've done works at the Ness Weir, where the Ness Weir holds back almost a metre, or almost two metres actually, of Loch Ness from Inverness. And therefore we've been identifying the public safety pieces that we need to do to make sure that these canals are here for the next 250 years. But we've also been looking at delivering the defects and, and making sure that we are... When we see problems on the canal, we're tackling them and we're managing them so that those assets don't slip into decline. So it's a balance between the two. Have we got enough money to do that? And I think the answer is we are challenged. We have seen an improvement from uh, our grant in aid and we are seeing improvement from the income that has been generated from the commercial developments. But have we at the moment got enough to do that? And I think the answer is the asset management strategy clearly shows that we are somewhere between two and a half million to six million pounds short of getting to what we would call steady state, which is having the canals into a situation where they are sustainable, they are maintained, they are fully operational. At the moment, we're operating with risk, which means that, that we are challenged when major failures happen. We are watching, we are monitoring, and we are uh, inspecting the canals every month, every metre of the canal is looked at. But as you saw last year with Twecker and Bonnie Bridge, things do happen that are of a scale that we cannot for afford to fund under the, the monies that we have at the moment. Okay, thank you. Can I just maybe flag up something around, which is, you know, um, in the submission that we've received, you talked about the Can um, Scottish Canals Asset Management Strategy, and on page eight under Canal Strategies, the, there is a comment that, quote, budget prioritisation may not necessarily include navigation, although it's an important consideration. Does that mean that using the canals is not a priority for Scottish canals? So I think that that one line in, in context of the entire report um, obviously doesn't sit well on its own. But entirety of the report, what we're saying is, as Richard has emphasised, is that we have to take safety before navigation because of the funding scenario. So absolutely, our priority is navigation and absolutely it is maintaining the canal. But in the context of the asset management strategy that is setting out the challenge, what we are saying within the report is that actually we have to look at safety risk prior to navigation. Richard, you? I, mean, I think as a, as a public organisation, and, and these canals do look like sleepy backwaters that, that wouldn't worry anyone when you, you walk along them, but there are inherent risks in there. There are reservoirs, there are embankments and, and there are structures in there that if they failed and we have seen across England and Wales in, in recent years significant failures that have then caused local flooding and, and challenged uh, and, and cost a lot of money to the, to the public purse to, to fix 
and, and insurance companies that we must make sure that we maintain and look after those canals and keep the villages, the towns and, and the, uh, the people and the communities close to the canal have to be a prior, number one priority. Then we've put staff and visitor safety because we have 22 million visits to these canals every year. A lot of people out there using them, very successful towpaths. We've got to make sure that they're safe. We are absolutely determined to keep the vibrancy on the water as well. It is critical, but it does come at a cost. And the locks and the lock gates, and we've seen that recently. We fixed, fixed a lock in, in Falkirk, um, lock six, and, and it was a significant investment, £350,000 to fix a, a lock chamber. And when you start to spread that across 90 locks, and some of them many much, much bigger, it is a real challenge. So I think what we've done in the asset management strategy is create a blueprint that allows us to understand that with our heart and soul says we want to keep everything open, we want to keep all the plates spinning. But actually, in times when, when money is difficult, we now have a blueprint that says if we have to, we would have to deploy the asset management strategy, but we have a blueprint of how we will do that balanced against public value that exists from these canals. I understand the issue of safety, but the danger is the logic of your position would be you just stop them. You know, something that people can go and see, but don't expect them to actually use them. And I think this, and that's what I read from that. Well, yeah, navigation is like a bonus, so it's not a working herit heritage asset. It's so something historical that we can go and look at. Can you understand why people would have those anxieties? I absolutely understand the, the anxieties, and and you know, I'm in constant conversations with the boaters about this to, 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 to understand. But but also, it does come back to, with limited money, you can only do so much, and, and you have to be able to, to you know, we, we just can't do everything that we need to do. And that is clear from the model that is within the asset management strategy. We are challenged. We are in a much better position today than we were a year ago when this petition came in. And, and I think that is thanks to significant investment from Scottish Government. But the canals as a 250-year-old structure that doesn't come with any plans or any design code or, or necessarily any consistent construction has hidden challenges within it. And, and we are determined to make sure that we keep them safe, we keep our visitors safe, and we also keep the navigation on board. But as I said, we can't do everything if we don't have if we don't have the resources. We have to have a blueprint to allow us to prioritise. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We don't have enough money. We have to think about safety, so we can't prioritise, as you say, you can't prioritise navigation, and so you end up in a position where there isn't enough money to do the the thing we'd really like to do, and we just do you not see that 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 just feels like you know that you're not challenging the the level of budget you've got, the budget you are using, you're using and developing the area round about, perhaps, no. because you're not prioritising navigation? I, I think we are challenging the... But the, you're not prioritising navigation? We are, navigation is, is, a, is a statutory part of what we deliver, so it's at the very heart of what Scottish Canals is, is all about. However, the, the monies that we have to manage and maintain the infrastructure are limited, and, and that is the same in any public sector organisation, and therefore we do have to make hard decisions. Now, I think over the last year, the conversations that we've been having with Scottish Government on the back of the model that we have created and on the back of the engineering science that is the asset management strategy, it has given us a clear agenda for conversations. When problems happen, we have, we have uh, a small contingency of our own to deploy against those problems, but if it's of scale and if we identify something that is large, we have no choice but to, to go back and have a conversation with the government, and we have been doing that. We've done that with Adrishik Pier, and we've done it with Twecker and Bonnybridge, and, and, and Cullachie, which was a, a major failure on the Caledonian Canal in 2015. We've had those conversations with government, and, and that is the, I think that's the agreement that we have between ourselves and government, that if, if significant problems beyond the scale of what we have and are able to afford, we can have those conversations and say, look, this is the problem, and, and how, using the, the, the uh, methodology that is within the asset management strategy, this is where we are, but can you, you know, how can you help us with this challenge?
And I think the other thing is, is working with volunteers has been critical to this as well. The volunteers were changing the way that we're operating the canals and working with volunteers to help us to tackle some of these inherent problems with the canal infrastructure is definitely a way for the future. But you, I mean, I'll not leave with a point, but if you say your budget priorities are not navigation, you kind of any conversation you're going to have with the Scottish Government is not going to look to funding to prioritise that. Can I ask Brian Whittleman? Thank you, Kevina, and good morning to the panel. Investment is obviously uh, uh, one of the key issues here, and, and a number of submissions have suggested that uh, there is a lack of investment from the Scottish Government, which is uh, a contributory factor into the, to the lack of maintenance. Um, there's a £70 million backlog which we've had rent submissions, and, and you, you've said again today, and I wonder whether... Uh, there are, uh, in your opinion, there are other contributory factors that uh, have led to this backlog of, of £70 million pounds of repairs? Thank you. Um, I, th I think we just have to be absolutely clear that although our funding model has not changed, we are much similar to any other public body. So I think I would, I would be cautious to use the word of lack of investment. I think Scottish Government have reviewed the, 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 the funding model um, as best they can and we have fallen within that process. Um, and as uh, Ms Lamont has asked, we have genuinely year on year uh, put forward business cases for additional funding and presented why it is needed. And like public sector, there is not enough money to go around and we, we kind of sit within that bracket. Um, so I think that's, that's the first thing I, I, would, I would say to that. And I think you're right. I mean, this is not something that happened overnight. This is not something because Scottish Government didn't have enough money to give us over the last three years that it's suddenly come to this position. You have to remember that the canals have been around for 250 years and prior to coming on um, to being Scottish canals in terms of British waterways in 2012, um, it was obviously a UK canal network. Um, and it's fair to say the assessment of the state of the canal at the time potentially didn't reflect the requirement of the investment needed and therefore this 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 issue around the backlog is not something that has happened over the last five years or as a result of um, lack of investment in that period. Can I, if I could, I, I, mean, I, would, I would view, view our canal system as, as, as a real asset uh, to, uh, to to Scotland and uh, we've talked about this the, the development of that asset and, and the, the surrounding uh, potential, uh, uh, not just in, in, in navigation. And I wonder, uh, uh, just personally, if, are you, are you, do you think there's a, there's a, a way here where you're, you're moving towards a, a kind of self-sufficiency? Is that is that the direction of travel, perhaps, that the, the Scottish Government are, are, are pushing you towards, this idea of, uh, of self-sufficiency? Aspirationally, absolutely, that is the direction we'd like to head towards. But I reiterate, £10 million on an investment commercial cycle will only go so far. And if we were standing alone in our costs, all things being equal, then clearly the uh, amount that we're able to generate through the revenue and commercial capital would be significantly more and therefore would be much more self-sustainable. But those things don't stand in still and therefore the costs have to be balanced year on year around what we're able to bring into the organisation versus what is going out. Um, but we certainly contribute significantly to the cost of running the canals, um, not least the infrastructure, from the income that has been generated from these commercial and revenue activities. And I would underline again that the grant and aid has not been the money that has generated that. That has been the commercial capital. And I would also underline that that commercial capital um, is a, is a long-term thing. So you look at the Falkirk wheel and the money that we're able to generate through the Falkirk wheel, um, that is a significant contribution to the running of the canals. So do, do you have a, a, a sort of blueprint timescale when you feel you'll be getting towards a, a position where um, the backlog could be cleared uh, and you're in that position where there's a sort of self-sufficiency element to it? We have several models around when the backlog could could, uh, could be cleared, depending on several um, investments al along that period. So as you can imagine, that's pretty fluid, depending on what money is available and how that comes in over that that period of time. Um, I'm also realistic about what is achievable um, in the next 10 to 15 years around the commercial modelling and the maturity of that. Um, so we, we work on various models. Neither one of them get us to a position in the next 10 to 15 years where we are self-sustainable, but we do look to continue to grow the income because actually by growing the income, that allows us to you know, 
invest further in the canal and I am talking about the actual asset management of the canal, the backlog, not recycling that revenue back into um, commercial capital. So I think we just have to be clear that we are we are using the, that money to do that. Thank you. Rona Mackay. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'd like to go back to the subject of uh, mooring prices. Um, one of the towns that I represent in my constituency is Kirk and Tiller, which is obviously a canal town. A year or two ago, can't remember exactly when, um, I had constituents come to me horrified at the at the sort of exorbitant price rises. Um, in fact, some people were actually made homeless um, because of it, and they felt they had absolutely no recourse. Can you tell me? I appreciate that predates your appointment. Um, can you tell me what's changed and what you know reassurance you can give that that will not happen again? Um, I'll, I'll I'll give you some kind of context around that, and then I'll ask Josie to comment a little bit more around around that that period as, as Josie supported the consultation and and the, and, and the development of that with Katie. Um, so we, we obviously have agreed the price in consultation and we've put in a time frame. Is it 20 years? Um, is it 20 years that we said? It was ongoing. It was it's on, an ongoing. No, sorry, no, the, the period of which the increases would, would hit. So the, the period in which the increases would it, develop. I think we, when we consulted on the, uh, asset on, on the pricing consultation, we agreed that I think no more than an uplift of £100 yes. every year to get to market rate that was established. Yeah. So that could take up to 20 years yes. to get to. Yeah. So the, the reassurance I would give is that within that process, we've already identified um, a way in which to limit and mitigate, to your point earlier as well, Ms Lamont, around um, the costs. Um, and I think it's about £8.80 a month, um, which is the, the maximum we would look to, to implement any further costs. But I'll ask Josie to comment further mm. on that. I think um, the the process of the pricing consultation was clearly a challenging one. Um, I think it's probably worth saying at the beginning that no other canal authority um, has has managed to find a methodology for setting um, fair and transparent prices. It is one that every canal authority is grappling with and is looking to Scotland um, to, to learn from. Um, Whenever you're dealing with price increases, particularly um, surrounding accommodation and residential accommodation, it's always going to be a challenge. And we did not enter into this lightly. Um, and this process um, was embarked upon uh, publicly. We had um, we knew that it had to be independent of Scottish canals. We knew that um, we would need to bring in independent consultants. Uh, we knew that those consultants would need to be independent of our voting customers as well to be able to understand um, what is out there in the marketplace? What are the market demands? And how to look at um, the varying facilities and opportunities available to our boating customers at each of the locations along the mooring sites that we operate and to try and come up with a sensible methodology for setting those prices. And that's what was um, that's what Gerald Eve and Bill Finger GVA were brought on to do. As part of that process, they met with boaters. Um, they held public meetings at each of the canals. And the feedback from those sessions was that um, boating customers told them, and they consequently told us, that uh, they needed to extend the brief to go and visit each of these mooring sites. And that's exactly what they did. And they did that without Scottish Canals. So they went along, they met boaters, they saw what made each of the mooring sites attractive, what facilities were available, and they took away uh, that information and the feedback from the boating customers, looked at their desk-based research and came up with a methodology. And that methodology, is it perfect? I don't know. Is it the only one out there? Yes, it probably is. Um, what that did do is lead to a set of prices which formed the recommendations which we then took um, out to consultation. The, the recommended prices, because we had said right at the beginning this was an independent process and was carried out not by us but by a, a third party with every party's input, that those um, recommended prices and the methodology behind it wouldn't you know, wouldn't be challenged, that we would all have to accept those. However, what Scottish Canals did commit to doing is um, ensuring that where we could, we would implement them in a fair way. And so the consultation that went out wasn't around the recommendations uh, in terms of what they, how they stood and what methodology was behind that, but it was around how they were, were implemented. And as Catherine said, the feedback from that consultation was from customers that they were concerned that, you know, some boaters might face financial hardship um, and hence the decision to cap those price increases in any financial year at £100. 
One of the other things that came out of that consultation was um, most of our boating customers wanted an average of about a year's agreement with Scottish Canals. But we made it really clear that that year agreement uh, could be extended to three or five years if, for example, someone had a child at a local school or if they had parents in an area or for whatever personal reasons they, they needed to be able to have security of tenure. Um, and and that, that still stands. Um, so I, I, I think I'm sad to hear that some of your constituents have, have been forced off the water um, as a result of, of these prices. Um, and I would be really keen to, to pick that well, up. I mean, I should say that uh, many of them weren't happy with the independent review either. Yes. Um, you know, but, but put that aside, I think I'd come back to the convener's um, opening remarks and her question. Um, I mean, voters have no recourse. So, so basically, um, you say you're engaging with them in an open and transparent way. How does that actually take place? Is that public meetings? or? Yes, we have public meetings on each of the canals um, either every six months, depending on the location, or every year. Um, myself, Catherine, Richard, and a number of other senior managers from Scottish Canals attend those. Um, we have uh, a volunteer group that meets regularly, which um, some of the members are here with us today. Um, we're in the process of trying to establish um, with our, some of our boating customers and representative of both boating groups, uh, a kind of an advisory group that would help to identify how we could spend some of our the resources that we do have available, where they should be prioritised in terms of weed management or in terms of encouraging volunteering and, and, and other areas. Um, but we also have uh, individual meetings, and myself and Catherine and a number of the, um, the people around this table meet regularly with individual boaters and with groups. Mm. And, f and that's a really important part of what we do, being accessible. Can, can I just put the point to you that one of our submissions alleges that many boaters are, are frightened to speak out at these meetings in, in fear of being penalised, that they might get their licence or their, their, you know, not have their annual mooring renewed. And one boater was allegedly threatened with possible legal action for expressing an opinion. Do you think that's satisfactory? I, I would fundamentally dis disagree with any of that behaviour happening in any of the meetings and, and I've never experienced it in, in my tenure. Um, I don't know when that happened mm -hmm. but I know when I joined the canals I sat with the, the boating community and we agreed um, the matrix of the meetings. As a matter of fact, um, Ronnie Rusak chairs the meetings to ensure that there is a balanced approach to the meetings and that it is open and it is a safe space um, and I think it's, it's fair to say that that I, I, I I don't know when that experience was. I certainly can hand and heart say it has not occurred during during my tenure. Okay. So just just finally then, so um, would you say there's been a sort of a culture change in uh, the dealings with voters, and also do you think they should have more rights? You know whether they're actually living there or paying paying for the facility as a leisure facility, should they have more rights? I think there has been a shift change in our relationship, certainly with, with the boating community. Again, I would underline that there are, there are really good relationships at an operative and a management level between individuals, but corporately, I think there's been an absolute shift, shift, shift change, and we've all benefited from that. In terms of their rights, I think that shift change has allowed rights that already exist to be expressed and to be utilised, and we've seen significant um, changes as a result of that with their expression of what they would like to see or where they've challenged particular issues. And we've progressed along that using the boating meetings um, to be able to implement changes or requests that they've made. And those are minuted. And there is an action log that, d that identifies what they've asked for and what we've been able to deliver against that. So I think, I think, the, I think there are rights there that, that, that possibly, owing to the previous relationship, were not utilised to their best effect. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very conscious of time. Um, you mentioned the advisory group. I wonder if it would be possible for us just to send us details of, in terms of reference, when it met, who's a membership, how often you're going to meet, whether that's actually been established. Equally, um, you talked about the £70 million repair backlog. It would be interesting to know how much of that is regarded as critical. Yes. And which is, you know, would be helpful, yep. but it's not absolute disastrous if you don't do it. I suppose my last question, given the nature of the petition, do you accept there is less protection for users of canals or rights of um, to complain in Scotland than in, than in England? Based on my conversations with CRT, and I would I would hold my hands to say I'm not the expert here, but based on the conversations with Chief Executive CRT, I would say 
probably not actually. Um, his view when I discussed the matter with him um, and took counsel from him on this was actually that even with uh, the Ombudsman in, in England and Wales, actually what the Ombudsman does is only review what the processes are that they've used and therefore actually doesn't really provide what the voters are seeking to achieve in Scotland. Um, so I'm, I think what we would be looking at is an entirely different um, setup based on, on the advice I've been given. But as I say, this is not my um, area of expertise in terms of the Ombudsman's. We'd have to look at what their remits are and how far they could go within that. Rachel. Mm -hmm. Um, Ms Topley, uh, your secondment uh, finishes in December, I yes. believe. Um, it appears that the communication between Scottish Canals and the user groups have, has improved. Yeah. Um, you're clearly going to leave a legacy <coughs> of that improved mm -hmm. communication. What happens um, when you're not there? This is something clearly the voters have, have been concerned about and as part of my um, engagement with government, um, we have been looking at ensuring that the replacement of uh, an individual that comes into the post is really clear on what the priorities are and I reiterate one of my opening statement, one of the first things the Scottish Government asked me to do was look at the relationships and how they had broken down and how we could look to develop those going forward. That is fundamentally part of, or a part of, the recruitment process for the new Chief Executive. Equally, we have a new board um, in terms of the board and we're clearly experiencing the benefit of that experience, that knowledge coming through as well. So I think two parts. Um, one is that it's inherent in the new chief executive recruitment process. And two, as I say, the cultural, the experience, the kind of the way that we've engaged has changed. And as a result of that, I think that has been embedded as a legacy and will continue at a senior level with the board and with the executive team. Okay, um, I think there was one last issue that was flagged up, which was about the question of um, the chair of Scotch Canals. Um, and it's, I understand somebody serving a second three year term and has been confirmed as having been awarded a third term, which the petitioner regards as unheard of. I'm Do afraid you, I'm an un issue? I, mean, I don't know if there's yeah. an issue you might want to come back to us on round yeah. governance and satisfying again the petitioner and others that um, there is a transparency yeah. in it. I'm not aware of the current um, discussions ongoing between the Chair and Scottish Government. As you can imagine, that is a matter for the Ministers. I'm confident that the Ministers wouldn't act out with the normal governance process, so I'd have to explore what that consists of, and I'd be happy to report back to the panel on that. OK. Uh, can I thank you very much and thank the panel very much um, for your time today. We're taking slightly longer than we expected, but like many of these things, you discover an interest in a, an area people have got a lot of focus on and people mm -hmm. care about passionately, but we don't really realise and understand the inner workings of it. There are some things we've asked from you, which I hope you would be able to provide us um, with further information. But equally, if there are things you felt we've missed in our consideration, that we'd be more than happy to hear from you on that as well. We have to um, think about what we, we do next. I think we would want to take the opportunity to reflect on what we've heard mm -hmm. and perhaps if for others if they want to respond to what's been heard that they would inform our um, work. I think one area that I do think we need to satisfy ourselves on is this question of whether, because the focus is on where you go with complaints around the Ombudsman, mm -hmm. is it the same as it is elsewhere in, in the United Kingdom and if not, is there something maybe we could look at there because I think that's really has been the focus of the petition, and we shouldn't uh, forget that. Brian? I'd say that you know, the, the, the evidence that we've, we've heard from, from both sides, that there's you know, definitely points to um, you know, a, a cultural change uh, and, and an improvement in the relationship between the parties. But I'm still concerned by the fact that, that, that there is no recourse and that that, uh, th that the relationship is, is totally reliant on the attitude and, and culture uh, of, of Scottish Canals and the board. And it would, it would always revolve around that, so I think that's something we need to consider. And I think the point that Rona Mackay makes, this is a direct impact on people who is actually, you're not just using it for leisure, but that are, are living on the waterways, and I think that's, again, something we want to reflect on. But So w with your agreement, we will... Um, reflect on the evidence and we'll come back to a further session with some conclusions but there will be an opportunity for people uh, having heard what we, we discussed today if they want to make further comments that would be very useful so can I thank you very much again for your attendance and I'll suspend briefly till our witnesses to leave
Okay, if I can uh, call the meeting back to order, um, and can I welcome Aileen Smith, MSP, for consideration of this petition. The next petition for consideration today is petition 1463 on effective thyroid and adrenal testing, diagnosis and treatment. The petition was lodged in December 2012. It was first considered by the Public Petitions Committee in Session 4, with consideration continuing in Session 5. The committee published a report on the petition in March last year, and a debate on the petition was held in the Chamber in December. At our most recent consideration of the petition in February 2019, the committee discussed the Chamber debate, noting that several members had acknowledged the work carried out by the Public Petitions Committee in relation to the issues raised by the petition, and suggested that this work could be continued by the Health and Sports Committee. The committee therefore wrote to the Health and Sport Committee to draw its attention to the calls made during the debate for a short, focused inquiry. The response from the Health and Sport Committee, which is included in our meeting papers, notes, quote, the series of assurances provided by the Minister to the Chamber during the debate and agreed to write to the Scottish Government seeking an update on progress. A response was received from the Minister for Public Health, Sport and Wellbeing and was sent on to our committee for information, which is also included in our meetings papers. The Minister's letter lists a number of recent developments relevant to thyroid testing and treatment, including the publication of guidance for thyroid testing by the Scottish Clinical Biochemistry Network in March of this year, the Minister's engagement with all health boards in Scotland to clarify the Scottish Government position on T3 prescribing, and the Minister's commitment to engage directly with people who cannot access the treatment that they should get. We have recently received some additional written submissions that have been provided for us today in hard copy, including a submission from the petitioner. The petitioner expresses her disappointment that the new guidelines, quote, merely parrot the same tired old ideas and take no account of the wealth of new evidence. Other written submissions are from people who continue to have a negative experience with regard to T3 prescribing. Um, I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Maybe it would be useful if we could ask Elaine Smith to come in at this point. Thank you very much, um, convener. Yeah, it's been a long petition and I don't think at the end, at the moment, there's been any real resolution on effective diagnosis and treatment for thyroid sufferers despite the best efforts of this petitions committee over those years. And those sufferers are mainly women and they're disabled under the Act, which is something I don't think that's come out enough. It's a lifelong incurable debilitating chronic condition and it does come under the, the Disability Act. In some ways, the situation's worse because at the start, prescribing T3 under the care of an endocrinologist wasn't a problem and now it is and cost is the cause, as we know. Lorraine Cleaver, who you've mentioned, and the petitioner and hundreds of other women are still having to privately buy desiccated thyroid hormone from abroad and their choice is to pay for their life-saving medicine or basically to suffer and possibly die but for example women in poverty don't have that choice to buy from abroad that those women have and if we could just remind ourselves desiccated thyroid hormones are medicine that was used here as the standard and in fact the only treatment until synthetic thyroxine was invented and then it made a big profit for drug companies. And there's still women around who remember how well they were on DTH prescribed by the NHS and how unwell they've been since they were changed onto synthetic T4. I've spoken to those women. So we might also recall that it's officially admitted that 10% of patients on T4 do not do well. Um, with many unable to convert. In America, it's 15%. We all think it's higher than that. But no one's telling us, or the committee, what is happening to that 10%. They, they haven't, there's been no answer to what is happening to them. Um, for example, NHS Lanarkshire have recently assured MSPs that unlicensed drugs are used frequently and they're using one just now for eye conditions and they're doing that due to cost effectiveness and yet DTH isn't used because it's unlicensed. So there's questions around like that. Why not DTH? We've had no real answer to that. I've got several letters, I'm sure the committee have had, they're all recent, obviously no time to read them out, but the main thrust of them is about being unable, still unable to get T3, with NHS Tayside seemingly the worst offender and Grampian a close second. If we look at the Minister's letter, it seems to be commending the guidelines uh, published in March, but they're not new, you've got Lorraine Cleaver's comments on them and you've got Dr Midgley's response. Two of the, the, the references are 28 years old and they, they also reference the archived 2006 guidelines. So we're no further forward with that. Um, and Dr Midgley has questioned Dr Colhoun's reasoning on these guidelines, saying they're basically erroneous and the statement is provably incorrect. He sent Dr Colhoun two recent papers by eminent thyroid experts. I think that really needs further consideration. 
The draft guidelines are also out from NICE and the, they have no clinical evidence base in them. So that's causing an issue today as well. Um, at the Scottish Women's Convention health presentation, which I'm not sure the committee have ever had any feedback on, they looked at thyroid. Um, the committee had considered that they could do that. And Lorraine Cleaver said, and I think it's fair when discussing this, petition and whether or not you may decide to close it. She said, talking about her experience and this process, whilst we've made progress within these five and a half years, people are still paying for private blood tests, consultations and thyroid medication online. We're basically paying a fortune for what we should be rightly provided on the NHS. It's still a battle. Often it feels when we hold round tables with surgeons and consultants that it is a bunch of professional men telling a bunch of women who are actually living this that they are wrong, so the fight still goes on. I really feel that a proper listening exercise by one of our committees to listen to the voices of, of the women sufferers needs to be carried out. Um, their voices need to be heard. When this committee heard directly from mesh survivors, it made a huge difference to their cause for justice. They've not achieved it yet, but it made a huge difference to that cause. So I think women patients' records need, uh, voices need to be put on the record in this parliament and it's unfortunate that the health committee seem to be moving back from that so i would hope that the petitions committee might consider doing a round table to hear women's voices to hear directly from the sufferers the minister's letter refers to the questionable guidance but it also says he's currently working with boards but i would think maybe the committee needs to hear from him to update everybody on how he's working with boards what they're saying considering we know that tayside and grampian still aren't um, supply in T3 to people that need it. He mentions the endocrine interest group, but nobody seems to know who they are and what they do. I don't know if the committee know who they are and what they do. And we don't know if GPs are in the loop. Have they been advised to refer to endocrinologists, the 10% that don't do well? Are they advised that they have to keep prescribing T3 if that's what's deemed necessary? I think we need things. If you look at the Scottish Women's Convention, they're calling for specialist thyroid nurses. Um, we need more women endocrinologists and we need the same funding and level of concern that diabetes is given. So just to close on that convener, surely L Lorraine Cleaver also really needs to be heard before the petition is closed. So I would ask the committee not to let down the sufferers who are hoping for a better outcome, to take some evidence, to hear their voices before concluding to see whether or not the aims of the petition have actually been achieved. Um, and, and sadly, at the moment, it really doesn't look like it. There's not a lot of answers. There's a lot of... Um, suggestions of what might be by the Minister, but no actual concrete answers. Okay, thank you for that, Elaine. Um, just open up to comments from the committee. Brian? I, could, I think, um, first of all, I thank Elaine Smith for the way that she's led, uh, led this um, um, very passionately, I would say, obviously. But, um, and uh, just to assure her that uh, in no way do we underplay uh, the issues uh, that, that uh, predominantly women, but not just women, are facing. And having sp I have actually spoken to several who, who ha have suffered this. I think the aims of the petition were uh, to make T3 um, more readily available and, and um, as, as a, a, a treatment. Um, and I was, looking, I was looking at a quote that the minister said during his... Um, his, 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 during the debate and, and his contr contribution, contribution to that and he said and I quote a consistent prescribing policy towards T3 being introduced throughout Scotland and the application of this is part of our commitment towards safe and effective treatment for patients diagnosed with primary hy hypothyroidism so there's definitely a com reading into that there's definitely a commitment from the government uh, and the government minister uh, towards uh, T3 being introduced with, uh, within t into the NHS. Now, as we now, uh, as we know from the number of submissions and from Elaine Smith, there are areas where that is not happening. And I wonder whether or not that should be done through uh, local MSPs, uh, um, and whether the, the, the petitions committee. Um, you know, much as we've, we've spent a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to, to, to push this, uh, this 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 petition forward, um, quite rightly. Um, but I'm wondering whether we, the, the effectiveness of what we are trying to do here would be outweighed by the effectiveness of local MSPs now picking up that picking up that baton for the want of a better expression, and lobbying the minister to say that what he thinks and what he wants to happen actually is not happening. Rachel? Uh, so, uh, I think this is 
that's there's something there's a log jam uh, within the boards because if the boards if Joe Fitzpatrick, the minister, has written uh, to the boards, all boards replied, all boards are committed to this. However, not all boards are, uh, get, you know, actually carrying this out. So he has then uh, said that he would work with the relevant boards to better understand uh, th their process. How can we, as a committee, be? Um, how can we benefit? Uh, it, within that process, if Joe Fitzpatrick is currently trying to work out what that logjam is, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm as you know, so, um, so wonderful to hear Elaine Smith's passion, um, and there has been a lot of work. Um, I like your idea about having a round table. I think that might just go back the way we know what's out there, we know what the commitment is, but how do we? Um, Take that. How does Joe Fitzpatrick take that process forward? Is my question, and can this committee put pressure on him to do that? I'm not sure. Okay. Anyone else? Rona. Um, I think we should hear from the minister. I think there's too many unanswered questions, and I think you know there is a log jam. There's 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 a lot of confusion, and I think the best thing would be to hear from him and ask him those questions. I, I think that. The if we're going to do something uh, something further about this, and it, it seems to me that, that we've spent a lot of time in this, it's important that we have an outcome here that yeah. that that, that, uh, that uh, at least partly satisfies the, the petition. The, the only thing left to us, quite frankly, from in, in my opinion, would be to to speak to the minister. As, okay. as one of the um, said I just just wanted to make the point that no one wants to disappoint any petitioner. The petition's been with us since 2012. There is a cost to spending a long time on one petition is that we're unable to hear other petitions. We will always have to strike that balance and that's what we're, we're wrestling with here. It's not about um, diminishing the issue, but I think the core issue that's been identified and there's huge other issues which people can campaign on through their own MSPs and so on. The one fundamental thing is, I guess, from members, Joe Fitzpatrick said he's going to sort this. He's got assurances that it's sorted. It isn't sorted. If we made one commitment, and that would be the only commitment, which would be to bring Joe Fitzpatrick before the committee and ask those questions. But I think it would be fair to say that we would not want it to go beyond that because I think that the Public Petitions Committee is not a substitute for the subject committees and it's not, subject, it's not a substitute for the normal business of campaigning and putting pressure on government via your own local MSP about your individual circumstances. So um, I think it would be very much in those circumstances that we would... I'm not sure if it satisfies anybody for us simply to continue it to no purpose if it's not actually affecting change. But I, my own sense is that that would be one thing that we could do, but we'd be very clear that's what we were going to do. That's a one session. Elaine? Thanks, convener. Um, and obviously, depending on what Joe Fitzpatrick would say, then you, you would take a view, I would presume. But, I, I, you know, the idea of MSPs writing to him individually... They are doing that. I'm being copied in, but it still doesn't seem to be... And, and as far as Joe Fitzpatrick's concerned, I'm sure he's very committed to trying to make this happen. But if boards are telling him that all is well, but patients are telling us as MSPs that all is not well, then, yeah, if it's a logjam, it is. But it also wasn't just about two, T3, because I put that in the record. When it first started, T3 wasn't a big issue. It was about effective diagnosis and treatment for thyroid conditions. That also included overactive Graves' disease, underactive, the whole gambit of thyroid conditions, but it did become an issue of T3, which is why I said at the beginning that T3 looked as if it maybe been sorted and then things got worse during the course mm -hmm. of the petition. I appreciate, I think the petitioner's disappointed, perhaps, that the Health Committee hasn't um, taken on board the, the, the sort of direction, if you like. I know you can't make any committee do anything, but the direction... To, from the committee that you would have liked them to maybe do a short inquiry um, because the voices of the women, I know they're out there, you can read, you've got the 50 um, examples that were given many years ago, but they haven't actually been on the record. They, did, they weren't featured in the end in the, the excellent report that you did, but those voices weren't featured. Mm -hmm. and that, that's why I think it would have been important for that committee to take it forward. But that's something that obviously I need to take out of here and try I mean, to progress. One of the conclusions could simply be that we, we would be recommending the Health and Social uh, Sports Committee take it further. But, you know, 
isn't possible for whole of government policy to be fed through the Public Petitions Committee and that to be the means by which any policy is changed. We can only, I think our job is to shine a light on some of these things and, and inquire, um, but I, I am now concerned and it's not just about this individual petition, but we're ending up in a place, if you're in the system, you're in the system, and folk are not able to get into the system at all. And I think that's something that we have to be alive to. Committee members, briefly, Brian. Just just to, uh, to, for, for, to, for, to Elaine Smith there, when I sit in the Health and Sport Committee as well, um, and uh, it's it's not because, uh, the, re the reason when, um, that we haven't done anything with, with this particular issue is not because we don't want to, it's because as all committees are, they're absolutely rammed with with e equally important issues, and it's it's it just it's that it's in the system. We just haven't got to that yet. Okay, I mean, I think while we're very much alive to the the very compelling case that Lean um, Smith makes on the broader issues around this, I think in in terms of the focus of the work of the petitions committee, um, I think we're agreeing that we would want to hear from the minister for public health on that gap between what he thinks is happening and what we are being told is in fact happening. And that's a, a broader issue about public policy. You know, how do you actually break into that process where somebody thinks, the minister thinks one thing, the lived experience is something entirely different, so we would be agreeing to a session on that. So if that's agreed, can we uh, move on? Can I thank Elaine very much for her attendance? Um, if we can move on now to... Um, the next continued petition, which is petition 1545 on residential care provision for the severely learning disabled, lodged by Anne Maxwell on behalf of Muir Maxwell Trust. At our meeting on 10th January 2019, we heard evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport in relation to action called for in the petition. We discussed the publication of the Coming Home Report, written by Dr Anne MacDonald, which looked at out-of-area placements and delayed discharge for people with learning disabilities and complex needs. This report made a number of recommendations which the Cabinet Secretary committed to implementing and which the petitioner feels um, supports the action being sought. At the evidence session, the Cabinet Secretary offered to meet with the petitioner and made a commitment to support research that establishes the level of need for those with profound learning difficulties. And I wonder if members have comments or suggestions for action. I don't think we've heard anything back from the Cabinet Secretary on the research that they agreed to do. Um, so it may be that it would be worth um, asking, I mean, that was, that was quite a significant commitment that she kind of cut across the conversation about whether it was necessary or not and said that she felt that should happen. So I think we would maybe write her to ask how that's to be progressed um, in order to establish the level of need um, with proof of, of, as it's been identified in the petition. Rachel? I, I also wanted to get some clarification around the fact that the, um, the Scottish Learning Dis Disabilities Observatory um, don't have an existing data set in Scotland that includes a marker, which we did bring up with the mm -hmm. Cabinet Secretary, and I am unaware of how she is progressing with that. I think that's the same question, isn't it? How is she going to do that? How are we going to identify? You, you can't say you're meeting need if you don't know what the need is. Mm -hmm. And I think we would be, having made that commitment, I think we'd go back and ask how she... When she's going to fulfil that and how she's going to fulfil it, I think would be useful. Brian? I think also the, 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 um, the Cabinet Secretary's uh, commitment to meet with the petitioner. Uh, I'd like to see how that, that's progressing and, and, and what feedback you can get from that. Okay, is that agreed then? So we write to the Cabinet Secretary really to follow up on the commitments that she made um, at the last session. Okay, if we can now move on. Uh, and for this petition, can I welcome Edward Mountain, MSP. The next petition is petition 1591, lodged by Katrina MacDonald on behalf of SOS NHS on the major redesign of healthcare services in Sky, Lachalsh and South West Ross. We last considered this petition in June 2018, shortly after Sir Lewis Ritchie's report from his independent external review had been published. At that time, we agreed to keep the petition open for a minimum of six months to allow time for the recommendations in that report to be implemented. The Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport welcomed the report and stated that she expected the recommendations within it to be delivered in full. To work towards this, the Cabinet Secretary indicated that regular meetings and progress reviews would be carried out. A recent submission from the petitioners is included in our meeting pack. They state that they were concerned that Sir Lewis's six-month review identified concerns that progress in implementing the recommendations of his report was being hindered due to factors including poor communication and slow activity. 
Encouragingly, however, they indicate that the one-year review conducted a little over a week ago was much more positive. They appear to be happy that community represent re representatives have met with the new NHS Highland Chief Executive and Interim Chairman and are now of the belief that pr the priority recommendations will be implemented within the coming weeks. Kate Forbes, MSP, is unable to attend today's meeting, but has asked that the following statement be read out. I am sorry not to attend the committee on behalf of my constituents, as I have been at most of the other committee hearings. This has been an incredibly long saga, and the tireless commitment of my constituents should be commended, as well as the support of the Petitions Committee members who have kept the petition open. This has given my constituents the comfort of scrutiny and accountability. The cross-party work on this with Edward Mountain MSP and Rhoda Grant MSP has also proved invaluable. Since the Ritchie report, which was announced in October 2017 by me and Ian Blackford MP, there has been a thorough review, a series of recommendations and significant progress. Ultimately, last May, it was agreed that Portree Hospital should, under no circumstances, be closed. A fortnight ago, Jean Freeman came to Sky and Loch Alsh to meet campaigners and healthcare professionals, and it's safe to say that there is far more hope and confidence. I thank the public the Petitions Committee on behalf of my constituents. So that is from Kate Forbes, MSP. I wonder if it would be worthwhile to ask Edward Mountain um, to make a contribution at this point and then we'll discuss what we'll do with okay. the, the petition. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, and it has been a great uh, comfort to the people on Sky that the Petitions Commission has been looking at this. The problem has been, as, as you are aware, is a redesign carried out by NHS Highland without actually consulting with the people on Sky to any extent. And I would agree with what Kate Forbes says, that there, there has been significant improvement. Just to remind the committee that when we started this process and uh, uh, Sir Lewis Ritchie had gone through uh, his recommendations, which had been accepted by the government, just barely six months ago, there were still five that were classed as red, i.e. active, but major concerns. There were 11 that was classed as amber, which was active with some concerns, and there was only one that had managed to be uh, closed. And we're now in the situation where there are still two that are red with major concerns on them, and there are 14 that are amber. There are no green ones, i.e. ones that are on track. So there's still a huge way to go in the redesign. And I'm sure I don't need to point out to the Petitions Committee that there has been a significant restructuring of the board of NHS Highland, which is still bedding in. We've got a new chief executive, we've got a new uh, uh, chairman of the board. And, you know, the people of Sky, I don't believe, feel confident that the new system is working. And I'd, I want to quote just purely a remark from uh, Lewis Ritchie's latest report, which, is, which goes like this. Although good progress has been made, it's important to note that the majority of recommendations are marked as amber and several still marked as red. There is therefore a clear need for ongoing intense focus on pushing forward with the delivery against the objectives in each work stream. We cannot be complacent. Now, I know the Petitions Committee are always under pressure to look at new commission, uh, petitions, but the point is, as you rightly said, Convener, that it is your, your job of your committee to shine a light, and you have done that on this. But I would ask you to keep the light focused on this problem, and maybe for another six months till we get the next update from Lewis Ritchie to find out whether all his ambitions and the ambitions of the government have been delivered uh, would be appropriate. And therefore, I would urge that the petition is kept open and reviewed in six months' time when the next report from Lewis Ritchie will be delivered and we can see whether his recommendations have been delivered by the government and whether the people of Sky can feel confident that they're getting the health service they demand. Okay. Any other views? Angus? Yeah, thanks, um, Convener. It, notwithstanding uh, mm -hmm. Edward Menton's uh, contribution this morning, um, I'm, uh, I'm actually a weekly uh, subscriber to the West Highland Free Press, um, and I was extremely heartened. I know you don't like you not know, use prompts, but I was extremely heartened to see the, the headline in last week's uh, uh, West Highland Free Press, round the clock urgent care to resume at Portree Hospital. So, um, and and the campaigners are, are certainly uh, welcoming that. So, um, 
clearly uh, congratulations have to go to the campaigners for getting it to, to this stage, also the local MSPs uh, and the Health Board, um, but also Sir Lewis Ritchie and also um, the, the new or the current interim chief executive, who I think brought a wee bit more um, enlightenment to to uh, to the views of the health board. So, um, uh, and also the chair of the health board. Um, so, th you know, th this this is in, in many ways I see as a good news story, but but taking on board uh, the fact that there are still all these amber. Uh, uh, situations highlighted, then there, there clearly is, is work to do. But I think, um, given that there has been a, a rethink, a significant rethink uh, up to now, um, the petition has done its job, and uh, I would be minded to, to close the petition uh, at this stage, but remind the uh, campaigners that uh, they have an option to come back to this committee should there be uh, continued problems in the future um, and, and, and they don't see the, the changes uh, complete that, that, that they're seeking. But at the moment, uh, I think this petition has done its job. And I think the other issue that you, what we could do, I mean, I don't think it's possible for this committee, frankly, to keep an intense focus on the very specific issues around um, uh, the area. It's very clear that the local elected representatives do and continue to do and will intend to do. Um, so it, it wouldn't be that that focus wouldn't be there. It would be a question of whether it's sitting with us is going to enhance that or not. What we could do if we were closing it would be to write to the Scottish Government and highlight the very specific issues around the areas that are red and amber and emphasise that in closing it we recognise this was still a concern. And that we would be saying to petitioners, a, a new petition around this area is something that could be submitted um, in a year's time. And it feels to me that that would be a more um, transparent position rather than simply sitting in the public petitions process without actually doing, I think, the job that you're suggesting for it. But, Brian? I, I mean, I, I, I see this petition particularly as, 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 a, as a success, a success for the campaigners. Um, I think you said it's our, it's our job, I think, to shine a light on, on particular issues and, and and bring that those to, to the government and the powers that be. And I think this is one of those petitions where I get frustrated with lots of them. Um, this is one where we have been very, very successful, and the campaigners and the local MSPs uh, have been very successful. So, and we have an outcome. And I think it, it, it's then the decision whether or not this this committee uh, is the right the right way to, to hold uh, the feet to the fire. Um, and I, I have got to say, I, I, I do agree with, with Angus MacDonald that, that perhaps um, we've probably taken this as far as we, we, we possibly can in this instant. Um, I like the idea of writing to the government to highlight where the, 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 um, uh, there's work still to be done. I also, uh, with, the, with the ability to, to bring this petition back, should it not uh, reach the point where it needs to be. So I, I'm, I'm from my mind, you know, uh, to, to uh, in this instance, to close the petition. Any other views? I agree with Brian, actually. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think we need to snatch the defeat from the jaws of victory. Uh, um, I would say to Mr Mountain that, that recognise that actually there has been a compelling case made. There's been work been done, there's been commitments made. The test will be whether these commitments are fed through. And I would have thought that it would be um, a matter of some disappointment if the petition had to come back and that those commitments hadn't been matched by action on the ground and people continued to be disappointed. I think that in itself would perhaps um, concentrate some people's minds. So I wonder, can we agree that we would close the petition? We recognise the, the success of the campaigners, their ongoing interest. There will be an intense focus. We will write to the Scottish Government um, and perhaps include... Um, along with a letter, a copy of the official report, because it does make the case and highlights the case of what, where the areas are that we would um, would want the Scottish Government to, 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 to continue to respond to the local community about what potentially might be problems in this area. Um, so we would be agreeing to close the petition. Um, um, we would remind petitioners that they can, of course, re return on this question, but we want to thank um, the petitioners and their advocates within the Parliament very much for the work that they have done. Um, and we would agree to close the petition. Agreed. Agreed.
Okay, thank you very much. Okay, if we can move on um, to the next petition for consideration, which is petition 1658 on compensation for those who suffered a neurological disability following administration of, of the Pluserix vaccine between 1988 and 1992, lodged by Wendy Stephen. Members will recall that we were due to consider this petition at our meeting on the 9th of May, but due to time constraints, agreed to defer that consideration. The petition calls for the Scottish Government to acknowledge and compensate people who suffered permanent neurological disabilities after having been administered with a Pluserix MMR vaccine containing Urabi. In, the submission, in its submission of 21st March of this year, the Scottish Government acknowledges that some individuals affected by the vaccine may not meet the threshold for payments under the Vaccine Damages Payment Scheme. While it makes clear it sympathises with those families, these own individuals, sorry, and their families, it notes that the issue of compensation under the scheme is a reserved matter. It adds also that it does not have any plans to offer ex gracia payments. The submission from the Department of Health and Social Care explains that the Vaccine Damages Payment Scheme provides a one-off tax-free lump sum payment of £120,000. It explains that the scheme was established to provide a measure of financial help in what it refers to as rare circumstances, where it is established that vaccination was the cause of severe disability. It refers to the two legal tests that are required to be passed, one, that the damage was caused by vaccination, and two, that the dis disablement is 60% or more, thereby making it severe disablement. This is assessed on the same basis as the Industrial Injuries Disab Disablement Benefit Scheme, which is a widely accepted test of disability. In a submission of 28th of March, the petitioner queries why the Scottish Government has, quote, not challenged Westminster's insistence that vaccine damage claims be brought in England and nowhere else. She considers that it's unacceptable for individuals in Scotland who have been affected by the vaccine to be, quote, treated differently from other Scottish groups in similar circumstances purely because the defective product was a vaccine. In her most recent submission, dated 3rd June, the petitioner provides further historical context referring to trials, CMO circulars, published papers and MMR working group minutes over the period of 1987 to 1989. She considers that there remains a number of unanswered questions relating to the gathering, retention and accessibility of data from that period, which she asked the committee to pursue. And I wonder if members have comments or suggestions for action. Angus? Um, well, I think, convener, clearly we've got a stalemate between the, the, the views of the petitioner and the Scottish Government with regard to uh, the Vaccine Damage Payment Scheme. Um, and I think given that the Scottish Government have no plans to offer uh, ex gratia payments, um, I'm afraid I see no other option uh, to us but to, to close the petition, uh, regrettably. Any other views? Rona? I think that that would be my um, my opinion as well. I, I, I just, you know, I think it's been stated quite clearly that um, we don't have anywhere to go here. So I'm afraid I think we would have to close. Okay, Brian. No, it's it's, it's one of those petitions where we, we, we've come again we've come against into a dead end. Where there's there's no there's no other action that we can take. We have we have um, two very uh, strongly stated positions and neither are going to move and, and I say regrettably I, I don't see what the petitions committee can be up or do. Okay. Um, Rachel? Well, I mean, the, the petitioner does say that uh, the Scottish Government uh, could um, implement a scheme to address this. Uh, however, the Scottish Government disagrees. So, as I think it was Angus said, we are at stalemate here. Um, I would actually be interested to know whether um, individuals who are in this circumstance obviously can apply to the fund that is administered by the UK government. Um, so therefore, perhaps that is why the Scottish government have um, responded in that way. I mean, what we could do is encourage the petitioner to speak to an MP because the compensation is reserved and is administered by the UK government. It's supposed to be administered in England. It is administered by the UK government and therefore presumably covers all victims right across the United Kingdom. And that might be something that could be pursued by her elected representative through through um, that process. But I think I share the view that, um, that, that there isn't 
anything productive further that this committee can do, although the clerks, I'm sure, would be happy to direct the petitioner um, towards the appropriate place in terms of getting the help that she might require and pursuing it further at a UK level. So would we um, agreeing then to close the petition um, on, on that basis? Agreed. Okay, is that agreed? Thank you very much. If we can then move on to the next petition for consideration, which is petition 1689 on hepatitis C treatment targets in Scotland. At our last consideration of the petition last year, we wrote to the Scottish Government, NHS Boards, Alcohol and Drug Partnerships and the Scottish Prison Service. Responses have been received as well as a written submission from the petitioner. All of this information is contained within our meetings paper pack. Papers pack. In its written submission, the Scottish Government states that it is committed to eliminating hepatitis C as a public health concern and real progress has been made in this area. The submission also states that the targets for initiation on, on to hepatitis C treatment are a minimum and the latest figures for 2017-18 show that the treatment target for that year was exceeded. A number of written submissions have been received from health boards in relation to the action called for in the petition. The petitioner's submission states that while health boards provide sufficient funding to meet minimum targets, it was clear from the responses that exceeding the minimum treatment target is discouraged, both through the setting of the HCV budget at the level of the minimum target and through additional measures. Some of the written submissions received from health boards explain that in order to meet and exceed Scottish Government targets, additional investment will be required. In his concluding remarks, the petitioner raises concerns that the government seems to have abandoned its ambition to be proactive in pursuit of eliminating hepatitis C. The petitioner goes on to suggest that this ambition could be achieved by combining the Scottish Health and Bloodborne Virus strategic funding with treatment budgets and ring fencing both at a health board level to encourage reinvestment of treatment cost savings into additional case finding for hepatitis C. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Yeah, I think th th this, th this is a really interesting. We've mm -hmm. actually debated this in the, in the chamber. And the fact we're talking about we're talking about a condition of disease here that can be eliminated. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and to me, it, it, that's something we should be um, not just aspiring to, but driving towards. And, and the, co the cost of treatment for, for hepatitis C is, 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 is something in the region of, of £10,000 a year. But the cost of treatment of uh, 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 the cost of treatment for the aftermath of hepatitis C, if it's not treated in the first instance, is huge. So this, to me, is very much sits within the preventable health agenda. That this is something that we can proactively do and eliminate hepatitis C. So I think the petitioner has a very, very good case here, and I think I, I would be really inclined to 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 push push the government on this one because it's something we can actually affect on the ground. And the, the, there's some the study been done, and I think it's Dundee. Uh, in Dundee, this is, it suggests that it could be done in, in as little as four years. So I think that, you know, that even even in a cost based analysis, that has to be something that we, we should we should really be ambitious towards doing. Mm -hmm. Rachel, I completely agree that um, the Scottish government's ambition should be to eliminate um, Hep C, and I think that uh, the petitioner makes a very good point about how uh, uh, they could reinvest the savings from the treatments treatment costs, um, and then uh, hurry up the uh, the process of eliminating. Um, Hep C. Angus? Yeah, I would agree with the, the comments from uh, Brian and Rachel. And, and I note in, in our papers that uh, um, my, my own uh, health board, NHS Forth Valley, have raised the issue of additional investment to, to, to deal with the issue. Uh, and also neighbouring NHS Lothian uh, have called for additional funding. So I would certainly be keen to hear um, from the Cabinet Secretary with regard to whether that's going to be possible, because it, it does seem there is a, a, a fix, a, a, an easy fix here that um, that can uh, deal with it within, uh, as you suggested, four, hour, uh, four uh, years. And if we can get on and do it, let's do it. Mm -hmm. That is a question about money has been used to identify hard-to-reach groups. Um, but I was struck by the fact that at least some of the health boards have come back and said yes, there's been a, a clawback which they've used for other things. So with the actual the fact that the treatment is now cheaper has not meant that they've treated more people. Um, and I think there is a kind of a short-termism there, perhaps because of budget pressures, which we understand. But that idea of the, the potential to eliminate whether benefits would come from that, I certainly, again, 
you know, I find that case um, compelling. And I suppose it is a question of um, getting a sense from the Cabinet Secretary whether that's, that's still their focus or whether they kept the target, because that was a target that's agreed we could reach more people with the same money. Why are we not reaching more people? Um, so I wonder if we would agree to write to the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport um, and look at this question of you know, the concerns about whether there is this desire to eliminate hepatitis C as quickly as possible and to ask for an update on any plans the Scottish Government has to develop a strategy for hepatitis C elimination following the work of Health Protection Scotland. Brian? The addendum to that, of course, is that there, are, there are other factors that would have to be considered and things like needle exchange programmes, etc., to make sure that this doesn't, it doesn't uh, proliferate mm -hmm. again. Well, I think it would always be, you know, it's not just the drug, it's the context, and I, would, I accept that funding may need to go to actually find people, overcome stigma, um, actually ensure that people will come and, and, and be supported. Um, but I think my feeling is that, you know, that drive to elimination has been lost. We're not getting the benefit from the, the fact that the treatment is now cheaper and therefore your ambition could be increased rather than just um, almost remaining the same. So I think we'd, we'd agreed in that regard and we're right to the Cabinet Secretary um, in relation to that. And of course, again, if the petitioners want to respond to what they've heard, they will be able to do so. If we can now move on to um, the next petition for consideration, which is petition 1707 on public access to defibrillators. And can I welcome Stuart Millen, MSP, for um, consideration of this petition. Um, members will recall the petition was lodged by Kathleen Orr and that we took evidence from Kathleen alongside Stuart McMillan MSP at our first consideration of this petition in November 2018. The clerk's note summarises the submissions received subsequent to our initial consideration of the petition. It notes that all the submissions were supportive of the action called for in the petition, but also raised some constructive observations about some aspects of it. For example, the Resuscitation Council UK and the British Heart Foundation suggest that less focus should be on defibrillators being fitted to the exterior of buildings over the size suggested in the petition. It's more about ensuring that they're placed in strategic locations where they're most needed. They note, however, that it can be difficult to establish with a high degree of accuracy where the optimum placement of defibrillators might be. As there is no public access data mapping the locations of out of hours cardiac arrests. The same two organisations also refer to barriers to bystander use of defibrillators. These are covered in paragraphs 14 to 16 of the Clark's note, and members will note that both organisations are clear in their views that the survival rate from out of hours cardiac arrest can be improved if there's an increase in public education, awareness, availability, and accessibility of defibrillators. The petition also calls for defibrillators to be officially registered with the Scottish Ambulance Service. This proposal received strong support from all those who responded, and members will note from the submissions that there is work going forward in this area. The Minister for Public Health, Sport and Wellbeing refers to the work to develop a UK-wide defibrillator network, and at a local level, the Case Nest Defibrillator Campaign Group sets out the work it has undertaken to increase registration of defibrillators in that region. And I wonder if I maybe just call Stuart Millen at this point, if he wants to make comment where we've got to with the petition before we decide how we're going to go further. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, convener, and thank you for your, uh, your welcome earlier. Um, generally, uh, I, I found that the replies um, with other submissions from the uh, other organisations to be very useful and very helpful. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, you'll be aware as well, convener, that, uh, uh, that Kathleen, uh, Kathleen Orr had uh, stated in her reply that, that the, the idea of a fixed of the 7,500 square uh, meters. It wasn't. A, it's not a fixed position. But the one thing that it certainly has managed to, to do is, uh, is engender uh, further debate and further discussion, uh, and also highlight even more so the importance of defibrillators uh, and access to them, as well as the uh, as well as the issue of the, the training and understanding about how important uh, defibrillators actually are. Uh, and just my final comment is just uh, regarding the, the, the submissions, the, the reply from uh, from the minister. Uh, Joe Fitzpatrick, <coughs> uh, where uh, he highlights the, the issue of the, the university project that's underway, uh, and that also that's still uh, that's still to conclude, uh, where he states in the in the reply that uh, the project it would be a good opportunity to revisit and consider requirements for pad locations. Uh, I think is uh, is very welcome the fact that the, this debate 
Um, it's in my certainly in my opinion, it's it, it, it's not finished, and uh, there is still uh, further work to to take place in this. And uh, and uh, I would uh, ask uh, colleagues in the uh, in the committee to uh, to certainly keep the petition uh, open uh, to to undertake further activity uh, in due course. Okay, thank you very much for that. Any comments on how we take this forward, uh, Rachel? I just want to make a comment, actually, um, following what Stuart said about the um, nature of the petition, and uh, obviously this committee is fully supportive of it, and it's changed in the way that it's evolved from the intention, um, and I think that is so important, that um, particularly from the feedback from the British Heart Foundation, uh, who are, are, and obviously the, the work that's been doing uh, on the project with Edinburgh University in terms of location, um, it we know that um, the British Heart Foundation are working with Scottish Ambulance Service and Save a Life for Scotland. Um, there are so many people who have a vested interest in this. Um, and I, I think what, what we've done so far as a committee, even though we, we're not sticking to the, the line of the, uh, the peti petitioner's intention, is still there. Um, so I think it's quite exciting. Um, how everybody is working together. I really would like to hear more about the Edinburgh project. I would li really like to hear more um, about what uh, Scottish Ambulance Service are doing and other people who are involved in this collaborative process. Okay, Brian. Yeah, I think I think you know. The, the, the first of all, commend the petitioner for bring, bringing this here and and, 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 and for, for Stuart McMillan in, in supporting um, his constituent. And, and I think it's a hugely important uh, petition. Um, like Rachel said, as I think there's, 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 it seems to have evolved um, um, and through through discussion with a number of agencies. Um, I think what's important, I think everybody's agreed we want a positive outcome in this, we want the best outcome in this, and everybody's throwing ideas into the pot here. I think the, the way forward for us probably was if we could get all those agencies together in the one place and actually you know, hammer out what is the very best option uh, going forward uh, to get the, be the, the best outcome possible. Maybe made some sort of a, a round table evidence session, I think would be, for, for me personally, would, would be very, very useful in, 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 in taking this forward to its, to its very best outcome. Angus? Yeah, thanks, Camille. I think we also need to um, get to the bottom of why there seems to be some, not blanket reluctance, but some reluctance to with regard to registration of AEDs uh, and um, you know it would seem to me that uh, everyone would jump at the chance of, of having a collated list of where they all are but uh, that, that's that's one issue that I'm particularly keen to explore if we do have a round table. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Yeah, I agree really with everything that's been said I think I think it's a hugely um, important um, petition and I think we're on the cusp of something really good here um, and I think to bring the stakeholders together would be a really good idea and we could, we could flesh out things like uh, Angus has, has raised about the AEDs. So yeah, I'd be supportive of having a, a round table evidence session. Okay, and I, th and I think we're all um, alive to the, the, the petitioner's views and the very powerful evidence she gave of her direct experience and we're grateful to Kathleen for that. And it feels to me that everybody probably kind of agrees on the theory, but it's actually what the practical delivery of that would be. What are the blockages? What are the, why are people hesitant? Perhaps how does it fit into a broader um, issue of first aid and, and CPR and all the rest of it? And that idea of being able to cope with um, a crisis like that away from a hospital setting. So I think there's a, a general agreement that we would have a roundtable evidence session with stakeholders. Perhaps those who have provided written submissions and suggestions could be... Um, could be part of that, and would obviously, would, you know, um, we would uh, we would need to look to who else we could in include in that. Um, whether indeed we would want, I think we would want to invite the petitioner. Maybe that she feels she wouldn't want to be part of that, but that would be um, an option as well. Um, and perhaps looking at uh, the ambulance service, Edinburgh University, and others who have been in, in, engaged in this in this area. So, can we agree that we? We do want to have a roundtable session, but we will maybe to, to, um, uh, delegate to the clerks to look at who would be most usefully brought together for that kind of event. Because we want it to be manageable, we want it to be productive, um, and we want it to kind of meet the, the, the desires of the, of, of the petitioner that this area of, of work is looked at thoroughly. Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay. 
Okay, in that case, can I thank you very much and can thank Stuart McMillan for his attendance. If we can move on to the next petition, which is petition 1712 on soul and conscience letters, lodged by La Laura Hunter. We last considered this meeting... Uh, uh, We'll ask us to this at a meeting on the 6th of December 2018 and have since received submissions from the Scottish Government, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, the British Medical Association, Scotland and the Law Society of Scotland. The Scottish Government has, produced, has provided a clear response that the Court regulate their own procedures and it would not be appropriate for Scottish Ministers to comment on nor seek to influence the work of the Lord Advocate or members of the judiciary. The BMA's position is that, quote, it is our belief that the use of soul and conscience letters provide a proportionate mechanism whereby doctors can offer important evidence to, co to courts without impacting too significantly on the time needed to care for patients. The Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service make clear that any matters relating to delays or halting of legal proceedings are a matter for the court, including the ability to request further information. They also provide details of legislation that enables accused persons to appear in court via a video link or for proceedings to take place in the absence of the accused under certain circumstances. On the matter of providing evidence via video link, the Law Society of Scotland raised a number of concerns about the reliability of its use ensuring the accused is in a secured environment free of influence and the need for confidential communication between the accused and the solicitor. With regards to the aim of the petition, the Law Society of Scotland stated that there could be better information made available for the public about the meaning and effect of soul and conscience certificates and to the medical profession about what information is required. The written submission goes on to say that the Law Society is unaware of any current abuse of the process and that the courts have always had a discretion to look behind soul and conscience certificates when they are produced. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? I, I think it'd be, number one, I think it'd be quite interesting to... to hear from the petitioner um, about the, the views in relation um, to what we've, what we've yes. received today. I think that, that was certainly something initially we should be, we should be looking at. And, and, you know, obviously the, the uh, suggestions made by the Law Society, we could certainly uh, ask the views of uh, the BMA in Scotland um, as to their opinion on that. On that. OK, so we're agreeing to write to the British Medical Association um, to comment on the views of the Law Society, because they do talk about the improvements that might be available to give people confidence in the process. And again, I think we would want to write to the petitioner to seek their views in relation to the written submissions received to date. Is there anything else? No, I think that's... Um, um, you know, it, the Law Society, um, if we're going to take evidence from them regarding this, um, will they be able to answer the question as to what would be an alternative? Yeah, I think I don't think we're suggesting we take evidence from the Law Society. Oh. The Law Society of Scotland has suggested some improvements, which are in the papers. And what we're asking is for other organisations to comment on on what, what they, they have said. suggested, a right. way of strengthening. I think they um, recognise this is not just about I'm not well and I can't come to court, but the potentially you're, you're delaying proceedings and you'd have confidence that. The, you know, why the proceedings have been delayed and confidence in that process and, and actually the fact that a, a doctor might have to go to court to justify the fact that they've signed this letter. So it's a different level than simply signing somebody off as being unwell. So I think we would want to get, um, you know, the BMA Scotland um, and any other relevant organisations to comment on the, the improvements the Law Society of Scotland has suggested and actually, yes, getting the petitioner's view as well. Is that agreed? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, in that case, can I um, end this public session of, of the committee's uh, work and we'll move into uh, a private session.